The broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Good evening, everyone, and welcome to the January 9th edition of Digging Into the BI. This is where your directors and friends from the Maryland chapter and the D.C. regional chapter get together and look at the latest issue of Better Investing magazine, and we look at the stock to study and undervalued feature. And there are the four stocks we'll be looking at tonight, Trek, Alta, Gentech, and Fastenal. And just before we got on, I, I made that classic mistake of January. I uh, put in the wrong, just instinctively didn't check on the year. That should be 2023. So my bad. Next slide. So here's our disclaimer. Uh, we're doing these for educational purposes. You should, uh, we believe you should conduct your own review and analysis of any company. If we mention any securities or, or uh, they may be, may or may not be in our personal portfolio or our club portfolios. And if we are showing a particular product or something that we use to evaluate companies, it's not necessarily uh, an endorsement of it. Uh, so please, as we always say, do your own research. And as you can see with that hyperlink down in the bottom, this session is being recorded for future use and we will have it up on YouTube and we'll show you that in just a slide or two. Next slide, please. So here we are for those people who don't know who we, who Better Investing are, is that we're an investment education organization. We focus on long-term fundamental investing. All of the people that are presenting tonight are volunteers. None of us are in the financial services industry of any way. We just enjoy doing it. And again, anytime you see one of those blue underlines, that's a hyperlink. So if you download the slides, you'll be able to go straight to that location. And if you don't know where to get them, we'll get those. We'll show you how to download the slides in just a moment. Let's go to our next slide, please. So again, we are an investment education uh, learn by doing. There are the two of the people that were there at the beginning, uh, George Nicholson on the right and Tom O'Hara on the left. Uh, and like them, we are going to encourage you to do your own uh, a study of a company, but by doing hearing someone else, it may sort of perk interest in you, and you may say, "Hey, that's something I want to take a look at." Let's go to our next slide. So, as I said, you can find us on YouTube, and again, up on top, it's a hyperlink to the YouTube page. Um, go ahead and uh, go there, become a subscriber. Uh, that's where you hit the little subscribe button down, um, sort of over on the right hand side. Um, each of the uh, webinars up there, and those are just the most recent ones, are uh, organized in what are called chapters in YouTube, which is, if you look in the description, you can just advance to whatever the discussion is of a particular stock rather than listening to the entire webinar. Anyway, uh, and that hyperlinked chapters will show you what a chapter is in on the YouTube video. Next slide, please. So to be able to navigate uh, go to webinar for people who don't know how to do it, that uh, um, sort of grayish, blackish thing on the right-hand side is sort of your control panel. Uh, the uh, white arrow with the sort of reddish background opens and closes that so you can get it out of your way. If you want to move it out of your way altogether, you can grab where the green circles are and with your mouse and move it over to another portion of your computer to take a look at it. And also, if you want to be able to type questions, we do have Kent looking at the questions during it, is hit where that blue uh, sort of cornered box is, and you can pull that out, and it'll be easier to type uh, for stuff. And we will take care of your, care of your questions uh, during question time at the end. Next slide, please. So again, this is if you need additional help, having trouble with your volume, these are places to do it. Usually happens that if you're uh, on your computer and you don't have your computer audio connected. There are the handouts over on the uh, uh, right down below. It's sort of in the green arrow pointing to it. Those are where you can get the completed SSGs from all of us, as well as the completed slide deck in a PDF form. So please make sure to grab that. Uh, before you leave, because if you just watch the YouTube video, you will not have access to it. Next slide, please. Uh, if you want to be able to take a look at the, uh, make it easier to see what's going on, is you can, um, as you see where you can zoom in and make it bigger, that's where that number one uh, zoom is, you can make that full screen, so it'll be easier to do it through that drop-down window next to the 87, 
or if we want to, you can also take a screen capture very quickly by hitting where the two is and hit the screenshot and you will be able to capture that information. Uh, generally, we'll default on a PC to a JPEG that will be on your main uh, screen. But if you've standardized or if you've customized it, it may go somewhere else. Next slide. So why are we doing this? Well, we want to be able to show you the resources that you get through better investing. Uh, and there's a hyperlink if you're not a member. And if you're not a member, that's great. We're glad you're here. You can get a free 90-day trial. We're focusing on people that are beginners, people that are uncertain of their judgments. We're going to show you how to use the stock selection guide. Sometimes we talk about the PERT report. We're going to try to show you the best practices for a long-term fundamental investor like someone in better investing. And this is also a joint program that's put together by both the Maryland chapter and the D.C. regional chapter. We have three model clubs among us, and we also like to be able to promote our Visit a Club program and just get people involved in Mid-Atlantic. If you are not in, in Maryland, D.C. or Virginia and you're here visiting, you're welcome. We're glad to have you. Next slide. So what we're going to do is we're going to practice doing the SSG four times in an hour. We're going to present uh, the four stocks have come from the monthly stock to study and the undervalued feature. And then the others come from either personal experience tonight. They're coming, I think, from a first cut and from um, the uh, repair shop. Um, but they can come from any of the other articles that come in in the BI magazine or on the BI website. Uh, just to be able to show you how much information and resources are available with your BI membership. So let's go to our next slide. And so if you want to know what the slide, what the stocks are that are coming up, you can go to the Home, home About Us news release uh, landing page, and that's where you'll be able to see where they announced Alta and Gentech, the two stocks, uh, the stock to study and undervalued feature that we're doing tonight. They were announced on November 18th, so there was plenty of time to take a look at it. And there's already the February one uh, that we'll be looking at next month in Icon and Williams-Sonoma. So let's go to our next slide, please. If you want to be able to find this information, if you you can always find uh, future announcements under the my uh, the account page, uh, under my account where the red circle is. It will open up over on the left hand side where you have the uh, um, home and accounts underlined in red. You can go to the email subscription service. That's the circle in green, and that opens up over on the far right the email and subscription service. There you can sign up for your local chapter news. And uh, I really do like, before you do that, hit where the yellow highlight is, the Better Investing Weekly e-magazine, and that will get you notices on everything going on in our community. And then you can hit Save Changes down below. Next slide, please. So we have the BI Weekly Newsletter. That's what it was highlighted in yellow on the previous page. It comes out, it's just for members. Uh, it highlights what we're doing nationally, uh, things with ticker talk and, and stock up, or some of the first cuts that are coming in. It usually comes out to close of business on Thursday. And if you have, if you've signed up and you're not getting it, check your spam filter. But they have a couple of interesting stock screens. So one, the blue arrow points to a high growth and value screen. And then there's also some upcoming events, particularly for clubs with the club treasure and preparing for your taxes for the upcoming year where the um, sort of yellowish, uh, orangish uh, arrow is. Next slide, please. <laughs> We're also on Facebook. You can find uh, both Maryland chapter and DC chapter there. Uh, you don't have to be a member. It's a great way to share this information and be able to convince other people of the benefits that we all see from being a part of the better investing community. Next slide. So. Uh, Cynthia, why don't you tell us, uh, since you're in the Maryland chapter, about the stock pickers contest you guys have coming up? Yes, it helps if I come off of mute. <laughs> <laughs> so I've the done, Maryland, <laughs> sorry that. about that. Cool. Maryland chapter. So the Maryland uh, stock, Maryland chapter stock pick, stock pickers challenge. Um, starts at the end of this month, the 28th of, August, of January, and it will go through the 26th of August. This is where we encourage club members and club 
chapter members to use virtual funds and pick stocks they believe that will outperform the market. Uh, what this is, there's no cost to this. Um, however, there can be a reward depending on how many people get in. So if we get enough members to participate, there could be a prize uh, fund, um, a prize you can win. But even if you don't, you have bragging rights. So again, just keep this, um, keep a lookout for this. You can go to the Maryland Chapters uh, site on the BI website and check out our contest rules. And again, the form needs to be in, and you'll see the rules that it needs to be in by the 28th of January, because that's when we're going to start, and it goes through the 26th of August. Back to you, Kevin. Thank you. And uh, with bragging rights, uh, my club came in second. So uh, I'm in two clubs, <laughs> one in the Maryland chapter and one in the D.C. chapter. So let's go to the next slide, please. And uh, Cheryl, tell us about the book club. Uh, every month, except for the month of December, the D.C. regional chapter, uh, puts on a monthly Money Matters book discussion. Um, usually one of the members of the discussion uh, will read the book and, and set up notes so that even if you don't read the, get a chance to read the book, um, you can look at the notes and definitely get the gist of what's going on. Um, the book that's coming up this month, uh, again, it's, uh, it, is on during the uh, third Tuesday of each month from 7.30 to 9. It's online uh, and it's going to be Chip War, The Fight for the World's Most Critical Technology by Chris Miller. And uh, you can go to the DC Regional uh, website and it will give you the link uh, to tie in. It's a go to meeting link that you can tie right into the discussion. So again, it's the third Tuesday from uh, 7.30 to 9. Very good. Thank you. Um, and Cynthia, back to you and tell us about uh, where we are with the Model Club in Maryland. Uh, as you can see, as the slide says, we are still under construction, but we are pressing trying to get the Maryland Model Investment Club back up and running um, very soon. So within the next month or two. Um, look for that. We'll continue to update you on the website and during these sessions as well. And just to let you know, that tiny URL at the bottom takes you to a dedicated uh, web page for the Maryland Model Club. So that will still be a great place to do it. Let's go to our next slide. And I think we're back to you again, Cynthia. I am. I belong. I am a founder of the In the Black Investment Club. We are strictly online only. Uh, we are across three states right now, Maryland, Virginia, and New York. We started March 2021. We have eight partners still. However, we have a new one um, in training, if you will. They have to come to the three sessions first, visit and see if they like, and this is what they want. They'll come on board. So we're looking to make it nine with an, in the year of 2023. Uh, we meet uh, the second Sunday of every month from 7.30 to 9 p.m., Again, I mentioned we were online. I did look at, we uh, met last night, so our education that we're going to have is going to be um, threshold and strategies for selling. And then when our stock to study is going to be booking and holding incorporated. Um, if you want to know more about us, we are inviting, we do have guests come and look, listen and learn, um, and then eventually join because we are strictly online. My point of contact is, is there, Cynthia Bonner williams in the email, there's the best way to get me. Thank you. Next slide. And this is uh, one of my clubs. This is the Montgomery County Model Investment Club. Uh, we're eight partners. Uh, we're on the third Wednesday of the month. We're uh, online. Uh, we've been sort of closed out from Rockville Library. But we've gotten so comfortable doing stuff online. There's our go-to-meeting link. You're welcome to join us. We're going to start looking at the first cut reports on how to incorporate that into our stock uh, presentation. And we're going to do Technoglass uh, will be the stock study. And there's a picture of all of us at our summer social. And it's nice to be able to look at us looking all warm and comfortable with the cold weather we have. Next slide. Gladys. Hi there. <clears throat> I'm with the Model Investment Club of Northern Virginia. And we started in... 2008, we have 12 partners, and we meet on the second Tuesday of the month, so tomorrow night <clears throat> from 7 to 9, only online. Uh, we did meet at uh, Tyson's Pimlet Library, but like Kevin's group in, um, in Maryland, 
we have become so comfortable online that uh, that's what I think we're going to stay. And there's the link. Our education tomorrow night is introducing the stock comparison guide, and our stock study is Clearfield. And um, the point of contact, McNova at dcbetterinvesting.net. Come and join us. Thank you. Next slide. Uh, Janet, tell us about your club or one of your two clubs. Well, I'm in the Virginia Commonwealth Investors Club. We started in 1996 with, we have 13 partners. Um, we meet the first Thursday of every month from 6.30 to 8.30. And currently we are using Zoom to have our meetings online. Our education uh, for next month will be the criteria for replacing a stock. And our stock study will be Western Alliance Bank Corp. I am the point of contact at the current time for that. Thank you. Next slide. Uh, Cheryl, tell us about the Visit a Club program. Well, there there is really two segments to the Visit a Club. Uh, what's up on the website for both Maryland and DC is uh, a listing of clubs that are looking for uh, new members. Um, they have put through some paperwork to invite new members to come and join them. Um, as with most of our clubs and other events, uh, it's open, uh, free to visitors unless otherwise stated on the website. And uh, we are definitely, uh, these people are definitely look, looking for new members. Uh, the other part of it is uh, the chapters uh, wanting to come and visit your club and do a presentation or a demonstration that would help your club members. Uh, we can do it either virtually or live at your next meeting. Um, please uh, contact, um, if there is the contact for the president, which is myself on the uh, front page of the DC regional website and within Better Investing. And please contact me and uh, let us know and we'll have somebody come out and visit you and there are some perks involved. Okay, thank you. And uh, yes, since this is digging into the BI, we wanted to show you whether on the left-hand side, you can look at it on an app, uh, either on a tablet or on the phone. That's actually uh, um, on the left-hand side. That's from my own phone. I, I've asked a couple times before, and everyone says, no, they still like to read the paper stuff. But I look at it on the app, and then over on the right-hand side is the e-magazine. It came out just this last week. I think it may have been on Friday, uh, so you may not, I haven't received my paper copy yet of the BI magazine, but this is a great way to be able to get it sooner and take a look at it. Uh, let's take a look at the next slide and we'll already show one of the articles. Well, um, I'm sorry, if you to be able to find it online, here's where you go to, it's the Learning Center BI magazine. And what you can do is, is that if you see where the green arrow is over on the far left, where it says Better Investing Magazine for Mobile Devices, if you click on that, it will help set up. It's a different password than what you have for your regular stuff. And you just sort of have to walk through that. The red arrow, the analyst reports and other, other resources, that's where uh, the, when they talk about in the magazine for the stock to study an undervalued future where there's additional resources available. If you click on that link there, that's where you will find that additional resources. And then if you click where the green uh, view, view magazine issues, that's where you can find it electronically and open it up on an e-magazine. Next slide. And so here's one of the articles. Uh, they have a new layout for the magazine. So when you take a look at it, it'll be a little bit different than before. This is the beginner's column. Um, this one sort of caught my eye, the pillars of, of three pillars of fundamental analysis. And uh, it talked about the economic analysis, industri industry analysis, <clears throat> and the company analysis. And um, sort of walk through in a very simple way. And even though it's designed for beginners, I, I'd like to read it just because there's always something that I'm sort of missing in my own tool uh, box that I, I can learn from the beginners column. So take a look at it. Our next slide, please. And here's where the investor uh, events column is. This is on, usually on page 51. It's compiled from headquarters. We have the, uh, I, I think I have the colors mixed up incorrectly here. The, um, the yeah, and I, I didn't change some things. I'm sorry, the green there, 
uh, it's the Rocky Mountain chapter, but what they really do is it's uh, not on cash flow components. It's basically their SSG class, and they go through the Colorado Free University. So that's not a five-part series on cash flow, so ignore that. But if you wanted to uh, listen in on someone else putting together the um, SSG class, you can do it there. Um, and then over at the next one in blue is looking at equity reports. That's the South Florida chapter. Uh, they have stuff free, and it's going to be on Tuesday, February 6th and March 6th, where they go through that. So take a look at it. And then our stuff is featured right in the middle, where we have digging into the BI and our book club. So take a look at those things. Enough with the preliminaries. Let's go to our next slide, and let's start talking stocks. And so here are the two we're going to do in core. It's going to be Trek, and then it's going to be Alta Beauty. And why don't we just go straight over to Janet, and you tell us all about Trek. Okay. Um, my, uh, my name is Janet Lewis, and I am in the Virginia Commonwealth Investors Club, as well as the Model Investment Club of Northern Virginia. And my study of Trex is using BI's core SSG. You'll find our first, you'll find several first cuts of Trex in the BI magazine. Um, but I just posted the most recent one here. And it is also represented in the BI heat map by over 250 studies. Next slide. Trex was formed in 1996 through the buyout of a division of Mobile Corporation. They went public in 1999. Today, they offer the industry's widest array of high-performance composite products, which were available in more than 40 countries around the world, with the largest market share of composite decking in North America, a growing international footprint, and a 1.2 billion in annual sales. They lead the industry on a global scale. Next slide. Trek says, there's a reason we're the world's number one decking brand. We offer the most innovative, technologically advanced outdoor living products available today. As the first company to combine the durability of recycled plastic with the natural beauty of reclaimed wood in a high performance decking product, we lead the way in applying this proprietary technology to a wide variety of outdoor applications for low maintenance and luxurious outdoor living. Next slide. Trek shows it is a bargain in the long run. As a side note, the Woodbridge Women's Club saves all their plastic grocery bags, 500 pounds of bags shipped to Treks equals one park bench. The first one was placed in Occoquan, Virginia, by the river and under the 123 bridge with the Women's Club plaque. And they're actually working on getting a second one. Next slide. Looking at its competitors, one sees why Trex is number one in its field. Installed building products focuses on insulation and on installation for garage doors and rain gutters closet shelving, shower doors, mirrors, waterproofing, fire stopping, fire proofing, window blinds, and other products. Now, GMS generates maximum revenue from wallboard products, and they're geographically from the United States. But Trex sold its commercial assets to Minnesota Bay Sightline Commercial Solutions, and they're concentrating just on residential sector replacing wood with recycled plastic and innovative products that will outlast wood products and be more cost effective worldwide. It's shown strong growth in sales and earnings until last quarter. In addition to its Virginia site during 2022, they built a new facility in Arkansas. I think they have one in Nevada. Um, next slide, please. Though Trex does not stand above its peer group and competitors in the BI chart, they don't actually compete with the same product as Trex. Trex does beat the industry average, however. Um, the CEO says in response to the current economy, 
Trex immediately took measures to reduce production levels, right-size our employee base, and implement cost efficiency programs. While reducing our employee base, we have retained our most experienced manufacturing talent, preserving our ability to quickly and efficiently ramp up production as demand rebounds, said by Brian Fairbanks, president and CEO. At the same time, we continue to support our long-term growth trajectory by expanding our distribution network investing in our brand and commercializing new products that broaden our market opportunity. Next slide. The price has lowered significantly, as have prices for most stocks in the last months. Investors may be more in hesitant to invest in repairs or remodeling until Uncle Sam completes his hikes in interest rates and consumers are more comfortable in the state of the economy, mortgage rates, their jobs, et cetera. Analysts and the company have lowered their expectations in accordance with these concerns, however. Next slide. Trex stands well above its peers in pre-tax profit. It has a healthy balance sheet and very strong financials to ride through a tough expected 2023. Actually, they have a very nice brag board on leadership and recognition. They were again recognized in 2022 with a Best in Design Award. They are among the 50 best U.S. manufacturers. Um, they uh, have captured the sixth spot on that list. There's a Builder Brand New study where they, um, for the fourth time in the study's 15-year history, they've earned top honors. Uh, for the 12th consecutive year, they've been named the greenest decking in the industry. There's a Green Builder brand index that says they have the highest score for decking for green builders. Um, there's a Green Builder Hot 50 products from 2021. They were in a list for the Hot 50 products. They are among the most trusted Life Story Research America's most trusted brand survey um, for outdoor decking. And they are honored with the 2022 Green Builder Sustainable Product of the Year. So they do have nice bragging rights. Next slide. For Brian Fairbanks, the president and CEO, the quarterly report sales and earnings were in line with what they expected and predicted in the previous quarter as channel partners like Lowe's and Home Depot, et cetera, drew down their existing inventories. Trex repurchased 1.7 million shares and they have more to uh, repurchase in the future. They have added two additional distribution locations to service and expand availability of Trex Outdoor Living products in the fast-growing Texas market. They continue to build out the Greenfield, Arkansas facility, but at a measured pace. The development approach is modular and it's calibrated to demand trends for Trex residential outdoor living products. It is building a big international headquarters in Winchester, Virginia, per one of my club members who lives near there. Um, personally, my concerns are in line with others about the decline in building projects due to our economy, increasing interest rates, as well as the demand by some grocery stores and possibly other companies that are insisting we reduce the use of plastics and like plastic bags. Next slide. Five minutes, Janet. Five minutes. Value line projected sales earnings at 14% and earnings at 13.5%. I think once 2023 is over, the company will get back on track. So I actually projected 11.6 sales growth rate. And then uh, after I'd done my SSG, I thought, oh, I ought to look at the member sentiment. And actually, they came in at 11.3%. Next slide. 
I was more conservative with my earnings estimate at 10%, allowing for adjustments as the company reacts to the housing markets and supply, labor, and other possible challenges in the future. Management is proactive in keeping expenses reined in while adhering to their mission to being a leader in innovative, clean products. Uh, the member sentiment had earnings growth at 12.7%. Next slide. Morningstar has Trex as undervalued, with 53.99 being their fairly valued amount. CFRA had Trex as four stars, when 42.33 and a target price of 54. My buy range was $28.10 to $45.70. Next slide. Overall, I do like the looks of the SSG, and I'm not really that concerned about this little dip we're seeing for a while because it, it is apparently worldwide, but I am eager to see how my estimates actually turn out as I follow Trex each quarter. And as a disclaimer, I have this in my personal portfolio, as also my club has in our portfolio, the club in Woodbridge. Next slide. In conclusion, it's a mid-sized company, actively growing. It's well-managed. It's undervalued. It is a buy up to 45.70 per my SSG uh, with a return of upside downside return of three to one and a possible total return of 11.6 average to high PE uh, average return of 16.7. Trix could be a candidate to purchase, but right now for very patient investors willing to ride through this volatile and uncertain economy. Prospects are, are not rosy right now for 2023, but they are expected to be bright beyond that uh, in 18 months. Thank you. Thank you, Janet. Very good. Okay, and now we're going to go over to Alta Beauty. This is, I listed, here's another mistake. I'm sorry, I have it listed as the undervalued feature. It's actually the stock to study. Um, but uh, we just, uh, Cheryl actually presented um, Alta in digging into the BI just two months ago. And like literally the next week, that's when they announced that, oh yeah, we're gonna be doing this as the stock to study. Um, so it's always kind of nice to hear someone else have a different take on it. Uh, so let's just go to our next slide and take a look. Um, so again, it comes from the stock to study. Uh, and um, I always like to look to see what the, there's usually a paragraph where they talk about the Editorial Advisory and Security Reviews Committee and what they think. And these are people that are uh, CFAs, which are long-term fundamental analysts that really take a look at it. And they recognize that there's uh, a lot of things that are going uh, along well with them. Astute discounting, free shipping for e-commerce purchases and promotions in their uh, member loyalty program. They do caution that there are some challenges that, uh, you know, there's uh, going to be higher costs, especially for shipping. It's going to squeeze their margins. This is a very competitive market uh, with very low margins. But uh, they even with the prediction of uh, a 2023 recession, they think that uh, there are some concerns that those financial pressures may reduce purchases of discretionary items like beauty products. So we have some concerns, but let's take a look. Next slide. And so uh, here's Alta. It's in the S&P 500. It's medium-sized sales. It's a consumer cyclical. They're out of Bolingbrook, Illinois, which is suburban Chicago, uh, and it went IPO in 2017. It's the largest U.S. retail uh, beauty, re uh, beauty retailer, and it operates not only its own private label, but several other resources for additional ones. Um, if you look down over in the lower right, the Morningstar Financial Health Grade B is above average, which is really good for a retail company in this environment. And it has lots of coverage, so it's always good to have that as a background. Let's go to our next slide. It does pass, even though I'm doing this in core, it does pass and you can see this much easier. And plus the acid test, the last four quarters are good. Uh, the uh, latest quarter is good and it it's, can, Comparison to the industry average on return on equity is really good. You can clearly see the impact in 2020 of COVID. 
um, which would make sense for any retail company. Next slide. So I like to also look at the CFRA report. Some of this, the, a lot of this is stuff that's basically just transcribed from whatever Alta submitted to the SEC on the, and its filings, usually in their member discussion and now a management discussion and analysis uh, of their SEC filing. But you can see that um, they have 25,000 products across six different beauty brands. Cosmetics are 43% of their revenue. Styling is 20%. And on and on. Um, and here's the thing: is, is that according to Alta, they estimate that the beauty industry is 94 billion a year, and that they have just a nine percent market share, and that their loyalty co uh, customers 17 um, percent of revenue, but they spend uh, three times as much as non-loyalty customers. Uh, and they just started doing pop-up shops in inside Target stores in the latter part of 2022. And they've also launched same-day delivery for online shoppers in selected markets. And they do seem to have really good uh, metrics in terms of leverage and liquidity. liquidity. And they have returned 1.5 uh, in terms of share repurchases with another round of that to go forward. So kind of a broad outline. Let's go to our next slide. Uh, this is CFRE industry survey. It does sort of point out some of the cautions that go on with that. Um, and you know, because it's in a specialty retail, you can, if they're not up to whatever the current um, standards are or what people want in, in terms of it, they can be out of place. But uh, they seem to have shown pretty well, but it's something to be cautioned with any specialty retail and any retail in general. Next slide. Here's from Alta's presentation. You can see there's where they have their $91 billion uh, in terms of the entire beauty market, and they sort of show where they are in it. Um, so they think it's large and fragmented, and it gives them a great opportunity to be able to cut into that. Pretty straightforward. Um, anyway, let's go to our next slide. And their target customers are someone not like me. Um, they are females. Um, and they, uh, the females account for 75% of the beauty uh, spending. And one of the things I found really interesting <clears throat> in looking at their presentations and stuff I saw was they had a really nice, diverse look of people there. It wasn't just people of one particular age range or race or what have you. And I thought that was really kind of, that sort of indicated, I think, sort of a culture that's going on. And then I heard a video from their then CEO where she talked about that. And that, that made me feel really comfortable that they're recognizing uh, the changing demographics of the U.S. economy. Next slide. Um, so here's some things. I always like to find some non-investment stuff that's available or stuff that's not from our normal sources. The Investopedia I like, uh, they talk about cosmetic stocks. There really isn't a good direct competitor to Alta. There's a couple of them like um, Revlon and some others, so a, a Korean company. But I was trying to find stuff that sort of fit where we are. I like the Motley Fool. They usually have a nice background on the company, and, uh, on whatever company they're analyzing there. And take a look at that hyperlink that will take you there. It's only uh, a month old. And then uh, that video that I was telling you about with their then CEO, Mary Dillon, <clears throat> excuse me, um, it's kind of long, but I just found it. It's, it's a series on Goldman Sachs where they have talks at at GS and they interview uh, people for stocks and stuff like that. So I'm going to start looking at that more often as a place to, to do it. It was very informative in terms of what they're trying to do. Uh, Maybe a little long at 15 minutes, but I found uh, that that's going to be something I'm going to start looking for with companies that maybe Goldman Sachs covers. Next slide. So here's the historic growth. And again, as I was saying, there's no good comparison with Ulta. I eventually decided on Dick's, Macy's, and Bed Bath, Bed and Bath Works. Uh, again, they're really not. They also had Tractor Supply and um, uh, Five and a, a couple others. So it's really kind of tough. And what I'm really going to eventually do is just sort of focus in on the industry average and peer group. But if you see that... Uh, um, Alta's in the black, and it's it's not so much which one's higher, but which one's sort of straighter and moving upward. And the, the two that look the most promising out of that are going to be both Dix and uh, Alta. Next slide. Here's Five earnings. Minutes, Thank you. Here's uh, um, earnings per share. Uh, same thing. Um, I took out uh, Macy's and, and 
Bed and Bath Works because their numbers would have really skewed things around. You can see how negative they are down below. Um, and as such, that's the reason I just really started going with the industry average and could really sort of compare it to Dix, even though clearly Dix and, and Ulta are not direct competitors. Next slide. Here's the pre-tax profit. Again, Dix is doing really well, but look at that uh, with Alta very, very well. And when you compare to the industry average and the peer groups that are in pink and blue, uh, they're basically kicking butt, bottom line. Next slide. Return on equity, uh, that red line is basically zero. So you can see even the uh, peer group average was negative at some points. Macy's and Bed and Bath Works are both negative return on equity. We don't like that. Um, so again, we're just sort of looking at Dix and Alta. But the bottom line with all these numbers, and we can go to our next slide, is no matter whether we're looking at return on equity or debt to capital, in almost every case, you can see a really strong case for how Alta Beauty is really a well-managed company. Again, here it is. The peer group is, for some reason, is much higher on the debt to capital. We'd like something lower. Um, and really among the lowest is Alta Beauty. Um, so. Anyway, those are sort of the management stuff. Let's go to our, let's start looking at some judgments. Next slide. So uh, the forecasted sales, historically sales has been 15.7. I went with 11. Uh, the historic earnings per share is 16.6. I went with 14.4. You can sort of see where, how they sort of measure out. Uh, but I thought that those were pretty reasonable. I think as a company sort of grows out, it, it may slow a little bit, but I wasn't so, cautionary that I, I took away a great opportunity. They seem to have a really good growth metric, like with the pop-ups with uh, with Target and how they're being able to adjust during a, a post-pandemic uh, retail environment. Next slide. So here are the high and low PEs plus the prices that go with it. You can see the, P, the high PE on the left is dropping down as well as the low PE over on the right. And so I made adjustments for it. So I now have a forecasted high PE of 24 versus a historic of 27, almost 28. And that was that number 27.8 was after taking out some really, really high numbers. Uh, that gets me a high price of 1,051 and 30 cents. Forecasted low, I dropped it a little bit. Low price is at 364. That's 25% off the current price. Next slide. Upside downside ratio is 4.6 to 1. Um, I feel pretty comfortable with that. Pretty straightforward. Next slide. The total return is 16.7. There's no money, there's no dividend with this company. They do they do get a lot of growth in terms of using surplus capital to be able to buy back shares is what they tend to do. So we're hitting the metrics of uh uh, three to one with a six, a 50, at least a 15% return, showing a lot of stuff that's pretty good. Let's go to our next slide. This is kind of new, but you can also find it in Core's audit feature. It sort of highlights things you ought to be cautionary with for those people that used to use Toolkit. This is where it came from. But you can see the ones that I highlighted in the red box, historic sales uh, growth and earnings growth. They're, those lines are not that straight. That's what they're basically telling you. But that's really more a reflection of the year 2020 so that they're off a little bit. Otherwise, they're really pretty straight. But this is a good way to sort of double check to make sure my numbers are reasonable. And I can see where they're, they're saying, hey, be cautionary about this. And I can say, I understand and I think, think that this is pretty reasonable. Next slide. So my conclusion, medium-sized, steady growth company, I think it's really a well-managed company. I think it's fairly valued. It's not on sale. Its current PE is 21.4, and the the projected five-year average, the stuff we'd see in Section 4, is 21.5. So it's only slightly on sale. But I have it as a buy up to five, uh, 5.22 and 70 cents. That's to get to 3 to 1 and 15% return. Great candidate to consider for purchase. That's my report. Thank you. Next slide, and let's go to our next person. All right, now we're going to go into the, we're looking at plus, and we're going to bo do both Gentech and Fastenal. And let's go over to Cynthia and take it away with Gentech. So good evening, everyone. Yep, Cynthia Williams. I'm a volunteer with the Merlin Chapter and the founder of In the Black Investment Club Online. Uh, this evening, I'll be presenting on the <clears throat> BI January 2023 undervalued stock, Gentech Corporation, which is traded on NASDAQ under the T 
ticker sign of GNTX. Next slide. Excellent. Uh, customarily, we are uh, to share where we found the stock and just give you all some idea how to get to the stock um, that we are presenting. So where we found the undervalue is in the BI magazine of the January 2023 issue. Um, here on the slide, on the left side, it shows you where the guests can find it if you were to visit our BI website and our members as well. Look at that, follow the arrows. And this is the first page of two of that article in the January 2023 article, um, BI magazine. Next slide. Just to show you a little bit of the numbers um, from 2020 to 2022, um, net sales where they increased were 22.5%. Um, from 20 to 21 year over year, and then 21 to 22, 8.7 in the net sales. But just to tell you a little bit about Gentex, uh, the state were founded in 1974 to produce smoke detection equipment. But Gentex is a consumer stickler company in the autos part industry. It's a medium sized company um, that currently designs, develops, manufactures, markets, and supplies digital vision connected cars, dimmable glass, and fire protection products, um, both in the U.S. and internationally. Next slide. So Gentex is first and foremost a technical uh, technology company, but their portfolio of services consists of autom automotive, commercial fire protection, and aerospace products. Allow me to bring their portfolio of services just a little bit closer to home. <clears throat> so when we look under the automotive section, digital vision, digital vision, think about your rear view mirror. So what Gentex has is a full display mirror. This is their money maker. Um, and all around vision and cameras in and on the cars as well. But Gentex is implementing scalable display solutions helping the industry evolve from an analog to a digital rear view mirror. The connectivity portion under the um, automotive section, um, Gentech own Homelink, uh, where it is an in-vehicle in connectivity system linking your vehicle to one's home. I know we're all used to that, but this is through their full display mirrors. Um, when you look at it, you can access the mirror digitally and be able to connect throughout your house, whether you're setting the alarm as you're leaving remotely, whether you're dimming the light, turning on the light, uh, pulling up the garage and or closing the garage door. So just want to kind of make it practical and show you that visual. They also have sensing in that full display mirror where you can, uh, where it would do uh, retina recognition, uh, safe lock. Um, to safe lock your house, safe lock the car, unlock the car, start the car, and more. Dimmable glass, um, just to bring it home, your sunroof, dimming, automatically dimming the sunroof. Uh, so to that and your your glass, your front mirror, your front glass, when light, lights coming from other cars are coming on. Um, just to go over to the smoke detectors, again, bringing it close to home in your Go to your local uh, dormitory in your schools, your hospitals, your hotels. Look closely at the fire alarm, the pull down, and look to see Gentex. It's so mind blowing to me when I can walk up there and see what I'm studying in actual. So they're there everywhere and they have the market over that. Also, in your aerospace, what I wanted to mention about your aerospace uh, sector. Uh, the company supplies auto dimming passenger windows for Boeing 787, 777X, and unspecified Air, Airbus planes. So they are robust in the aerospace market as well. Uh, what I like about the portfolio of services is where they're going. They also have emerging technology, and in that emerging technology, 
uh, from chemical de detection to medical lighting. Um, they have a contract with Mayo Clinic uh, retrospect. Um, with the AI medical imaging, and then your e-site, again, to bring it close to home. Think about your virtual uh, reality glasses that you play your golf with or you bowl with. So they are uh, partnering with e-site with the wearable vision enhancement. So they have a lot of things emerging coming forward, coming on, and I'm excited about what they have to bring to the table. Next slide, please. Here, okay, we're going to jump into the BI tools. Uh, what I have here on the right upper, the upper right hand corner, just to kind of show you, not to teach you um, how to use the BI tools, but just to show you my strategy on how I got back, got through it, what I do inside of the BI tools. But here in the upper right hand corner, I use, I pull, my favorites are Morningstar, Value Line, and Yahoo. Um, I always, pull on those analysts to get the numbers. So on, on the grid, it shows you sales, EPS, sales and EPS, both in percentage and dollars. So what I do is take those numbers and I pull the average. I'm not trying to beat the market. I'm not trying to beat out or be better than the analysts. I just want to have comparable numbers so I can um, at least have something to bounce back on when I'm actually creating forecasts. So with those numbers going across, um, the average came in at 11.25 for the sales and 11.98 for the EPS. Um, stay conservative, went with the average. Even though the 9.8 is above, you think you rounded up, I stuck with 11 for both the sales forecast and the EPS forecast. If you look at the third line where it says the average dollar figure is 27, I'm sorry, 25, 765. If you look at the sales historically, um, the five year estimate in the system is 29.17, so not far off. Again, just trying to have something to back, back to kind of guide me through um, my strategic way of finding um, a forecast, if you will. Down below, pre-tax margin, your ROE and the DTC. Um, DTC looks good, and I'll explain. I'll speak to that more later. But again, um, this is a this is the information in the BI I wanted to share. Next slide, please. Five minutes, five minutes. And Thank you. Uh, here, I just wanted to, before I jump into the uh, numbers going forward, uh, I wanted to share you some of the comparables in the, with the peers. I've highlighted all where the, where the numbers are the best. Gentech's come out of these three. We have Mega, Meg, Magna International, um, Canadian-based. Um, APTIX, they are Ireland, I believe, and Garnett Motion is Switzerland. Um, these companies are, are they're comparable. There are other, there were several others. I went with this, but just from looking at this and comparing it both to the peer group average and the industry average, you can see that Gentex is soaring. Um, for return on equity, we have APTIV. They are. Are leading there, but if you look at 20.2% for Gentex, they're not far off, and they are better than the industry average. Debt to capital, I want you to definitely take a look at that. They don't carry a lot of debt, um, no outstanding debt as of the year 2021, and this is usually the case for history, and they're looking to stay that way going forward. Uh, next slide, please. All right, back to the numbers. I wanted to, again, the 11, the four class for sales and EPS for me were 11, which yielded a high price for the next five years at 46.5 and a low price uh, for the next five years at 16.2. Um, I also uh, looked at the audit uh, and tried to see where some of the things they could tell us if I, if I agreed, if I, oh, just kind of giving me some instruction that Ken brought up earlier, um, Kevin brought up earlier. So one of the things it says that some of the um, numbers didn't gel, so maybe look at those outliers, maybe cross them out. So that's what I did. When I, I did both toggle between the two, but there wasn't a big difference if I left them on or got rid of them. But the 20 year 2021, I did uh, cross out those outliers and it gave me the averages that I did. Just wanted to kind of point that out that it wasn't a big difference. 
Um, but just to give you, this is a whole, it's one to four, 1.4 to 1 for the upside down ratio. But again, my high is 46.5 and um, my low is 16.2. Next slide, please. Two minutes. Excellent. Um, again, just repeating um, where the current price is at 28.8 um, as of Friday the 6th, um, giving us that 1.4 to 1. Um, where the forecasted, my forecasted low and high was 62 and 46.5. Next slide. Here I just wanted to um, uh, the, uh, so show the, buy, the below buy price to buy. It's best to buy this, this stock at below 23.8. So it is a hold currently um, according to the forecast that we put in here. Next slide, please. I think it's, this is where I wanted to be. Just wanted to show a little bit of risk and rewards with Gentex. Um, we all are familiar with the long standing supply chain shortage and disruption, and in, in such as the chip, because it's a technology company, this chip shortage is impacting them. However, F, um, Gentex has contracts with their FDM, which is the full display mirror, 14 contracts, uh, contracts with 14 automakers, and more in the pipeline, just to name two. GM and Toyota, because I love to make it visual, uh, bring it home. Continued R&D, which is research and development and overhead spending. However, several ca all cash acquisitions have been made since March 2020, so they have things in the works. Uh, Magna International is their largest competitor because Magna has deep pockets, but they are international. Um, and what I say to that is Gentex has quality and reliability um, with the companies that they are in bed with, if you will. And they have that emergency tech, emerging technology that's going to push them over. Um, there's a newer low cost based mirror product that's out in the south, uh, southeast area, but I counter that with the mirrors aren't solely sourced based on price. Customers are looking for, again, that reliability and that quality that Gentex gives. Next slide, please. I conclude this presentation with Gentex as a medium-sized, steady growth company. Um, they are well-managed, um, a well-managed company. It is overvalued, trading above its five-year average high PE. Gentex is a worthy candidate to consider adding it to your watch list, as I did last night with our club. <laughs> so that's my disclaimer. However, Gentex is a buy below 23.8, and right now it's at 28.8 to satisfy the 15 total return and three to one. Thank you, Kevin, back to you. Thank you, Cynthia. Okay, and last but certainly not least, Gladys, tell us all about Fastenal. Well, thank you. Good evening, everyone. I'm uh, with the Model Investment Club of Northern Virginia, McNova, and I was motivated to find Fastenal because of this fall's chapter uh, speaker, Craig Bremer, the case for stocks with growing dividends. So I wanted to find a stock to, uh, to present with growing dividends, and that is Fastenal. It's in the industrial sector, and its size is medium. It has about $6 billion in sales and growing. Next slide. <laughs> Where I found it, first in the BI Magazine, I love the repair shop articles by Scott Hornsberger, da Daniel Boyle. And in December, Scott was ad uh, advising one of the clubs whose portfolio he was uh, repairing to check out Fastnail with its pristine balance sheet, this among the strongest and steadiest players in the notoriously volatile industrial sector. And then the previous month, Daniel Boyle, in November said, I think the analyst consensus estimate of 10% for annual earnings growth is too low. If the US economy turns down and shares become cheaper, buy. Then there were, I found two first cut stock reports, one by Ohio in September of 2022 and another by Georgia from Georgia in August of 2022. Both of them were very positive. Next slide. So, Fastenal was started in 1967 in Minnesota as a fastener store. 
And today, it offers a broad array of hardware and safety tools for 400,000 customers. Most of these are small tools, and but fasteners remain the largest sales category in its inventory. Its customers are manufacturers, heavy equipment use, uh, makers, and users, construction, primarily in North America, including Canada and Mexico, but some in Europe. This are the, its services are supply, supply chain solutions. They have vending and vendor managed inventories. They have customized manufacturing of small parts. They offer industrial services like calibrations and fabrication and repairs, particularly with anything involving fasteners. And they um, offer consulting on tools and inventory management. Next slide. They sell through standalone stores and in customer facilities, and all are supplied by 14 distribution centers. If you look at the top row of Fastenal, it shows the exterior of a standalone Fastenal store, and inside you have these various bins where customers can shop for their small tools. The lower two slides uh, uh, pictures show the interior of a customer facility where they specifically have asked for certain kinds of small equipment and they put them into vending machines and they track these digitally and they service both machines in both locations from their own trucks and 14 distribution centers so it's always just in time inventory control next slide when you look at the difference of where they sell, you'll see they're almost equal, uh, moving from left to right. Um, in 2020, they had a total of about 3,000 stores. About 2,000 were um, open to the general public, and about 1,200 were on site. By the end of third quarter 22, that would have been this fall, look how close the ending on sites were. So that market of having specific customers who want you on site to provide all their small tool requests is growing over the public stores. Next slide. According to value line, you see that it is overvalued, its timeliness is five, but looking on the very left, you will see that its projections for the next five years are annual returns of seven to 14 percent and price from low of 60 to 80. Today, the price was about 48. If you look at the little box around the chart, you see that the price has been continuing to go up, and so has cash flow. And if you look uh, at the box um, on the bottom of this sort of graph, you will see if you're moving your eyes from 2018 to 2023, that cash flow, earnings, and declared dividends are all growing. At the bottom, the company's financial strength is an A+. Plus. Its price stability is 85, and its earnings predictability, 95. Value Line says, Fastenal has one of the highest earnings predictability ratings in its sector. because It has fairly steady growth, uh, myriad products, and a loyal customer base. Although we look for sales and earnings to dip next year, and I think that comment from Value Line came from a presentation to investors in October after third quarter earnings this year, where he said that he had uh, been learning of some softening in the manufacturing and large equipment uh, uh, sectors of their, their customer base. And of course, we know the construction has declined as well. But they will keep on uh, moving, as you will see. Next slide. Morningstar compares them to three competitors. Two of them are very small. MSC um, Industrial Direct, they have a lot of the small equipment also, including fasteners. And Webco on the right, which offers a range of other things that um, Fastenal does not, like carpeting and corrugated boxes for shipping and so on. W.W. Granger is probably the closest, but I don't think they service individual customers in the same way that Fastenal does. If you look at the top line with the bars of the data underneath these thermometers, as it were, the economic moat 
for fastenal is the only one that has a wide moat. And then if you look at the next box, it's capital allocation. It's the only one with exemplary um, management. And um, all uh, three of them offer dividends. Fastenal's is about two and a half percent. Next slide. Morningstar analysts in December said uh, that the vending and on-site programs provide a long growth runway for Fastenal. Remember, this is a very fractionated um, industry, and Fastenal can capitalize on its scale, the broad product portfolio, and inventory management services. They've invested a lot in this in IT. Their business model generates strong free cash flow throughout the cycle. They say they're, that their profit margins could be um, affected by non-fastener sales and the on-site programs, which are becoming larger than the walk-in customers. But um, I think it's other, an, another way to look at it is the, the growth of these on-site customers makes it a more sticky business for Fastenal. And then in, and under the economic mode, I just wanted to point out that Fastenal benefits from things that many of its competitors do not, volume-based rebates and, on, uh, and other sales incentives, incentives and unavailable to smaller distributors and preferential treatment from suppliers. In fact, I had read about one in which they could actually order customized fasteners and, that, and small products from their suppliers for their customers. Next slide. Four minutes, Gladys, four minutes. CFRA said that they were concerned about growth dropping from 15% in 22 to 7% in 23 because of, uh, um, on the right, uh, of the drop in demand for manufacturing markets as softening price pockets. Um, they do say that the e-commerce is becoming a growing contributor of unit sales. They have both catalog sales and, of course, their inventory management that I mentioned, and that's growing exponentially. Um, the one a caveat that CFRA said is that the ramping federal infrastructure funding could benefit Fastener and other product growth above this current outlook. Next page. When you compare Fastener to these peers, you see that uh, from the left, the pre-tax profit on sales, Fastenal's is about 20%, where the India industry and peer average is around 11%. To the right, debt to capital, Fastenal is only 18%. Industry average and peer average is over 40% or about 40%. Return on equity, Fastenal is again the highest of 30%. Industry average, 26 or 28 from the peers. Next slide. In my SSG, you notice that in the price bar, the price is close to the bottom of this year. On the other hand, there isn't much variation in price, so, but we'll just have to wait. The number two, analyst consensus estimates are that two-year sales will be over 9% and long-term estimates about 10%. However, number three, I projected, thinking of CFRA, I forecasted 7% sales. 7.4% sales and um, use a preferred procedure to get a 6.6% earnings per share. Next slide. I just wanted to remind you of the growing and consistent dividend payments. Look at that beautiful growth from 2017, working your way downward through 2021. Next slide. So when I resist, assess the risk and reward, I looked at the average PEs for um, the last, what it was, five years. I'm, you, on this screen, you only see the last years. But the average was a little over 30 high and um, 20 low. So for the average high, I used, made a little lower, I made it 29. And that gave me a high price of 74.6, which is still lower than Value Line's high of 80. And the low price for the next years, I used the average low PE of 20, and that gave me a low stock price of 37, which is lower than it's been the last two years, although back in 2020, it got in 
into the 20s. Next slide. Two minutes. So this gives me an upside downside ratio of 2.6. It's clearly in the hold zone to one. Next slide. So you can see that if we were to buy this, the total return would be at the high PE of 11.5%. Projected return at average would be 8%. The buy price to satisfy a 3 to 1 and 15% total return would be about 40.9, um, but I would recommend not buying anything above 47. Next slide. In conclusion, Fastenal is a medium-sized moderate growth company using technology to nimbly expand and hold its customer base. It's exceptionally managed. It's slightly overpriced trading above its five-year high average PE, but as a worthy candidate to add to a watch list, a buy up to 47, but particularly 40.9 to satisfy 15% return and 3.1 upside downside ratio. Thank you. Thank you, Gladys. Okay, we went through those very, very quickly. I can see I had another glitch here. I should have filled that in correctly for Trex. Um, that was actually uh, through some first cuts. But uh, those are the four stocks. And let's go to our next slide and we'll do sort of a recap that we do on this. So what we have done over the time is that we talk about T. Rowe Price's life cycle of a company and that companies like human beings have three phases, sort of a growth, maturity, and decadence. In this visual analysis, which is on the uh, SSG Digital Handbook, is a great way to just sort of visualize what we just finished talking about with the SSGs. So let's go first with Janet and tell us why you put Trek over there in that explosive growth area. Well, actually, because it's growing at the rate of an expected small company and it is a mid-sized company. It's a leader and it has a niche market. So I, I see a bright future for Trex. Okay. And then I did Alta, and uh, Alta I have right sort of in the middle between explosive and mature, a little bit more on the explosive side. And, you know, there is a little bit of concern with retails and how they're adjusting with that. Um, and But the fact is, is that they think that they only have 9% market share of the entire uh, beauty and cosmetic stuff. And the way that they seem to manage, I'm really impressed with the management and uh, a lot of the things that are going on with it. So I think that's still right smack dab in that opportunity for us. And um, uh, Cynthia, tell us uh, why you picked that location for Gentech. Gentech, um, as I mentioned, is a medium size, but they are a steady growth company. Um, I didn't make them explosive because they've been out there for a minute, but what they have emerging is right in the wheelhouse of what society is looking for. So I think they are on the right path, and I believe that they have that mature growth. They're capturing what needs to happen, and they um their debt. They don't have much debt, so they have cash on that that a mass cash flow to jump in where they need to jump in, when they need to jump in, and be able to present. They have a lot of things in the fund. Okay, thank you. And Gladys, tell us about Fast and All. I think Fastenal, because it's been around now for over 40 years, it is in, in um, the mature growth area, and also because of the projections for its growth, which are between you know, um, about 14%, uh, double-digit growth, I think, but um, low double-digit growth, not, not up in the 20s. But I think it's a fabulous dividend grower, and um, they really manage to maintain their price and their customers. So I think it's um, uh, definitely something for somebody to hold. Okay. Well, we've been doing chatting for basically an hour and 15 minutes. Now it's time to do some voting. So let's go to the next slide. And uh, we'll let all of you decide which one you want to vote for. Cheryl, if you can open up the poll. And while you're doing this, uh, we can't vote on it. So you guys select it. Go ahead and um, either get ready to raise your hand and ask questions or write in the question box, and Kent will keep track of those things. So let's see how we're doing on the voting stuff. Uh, okay. We have about 60% of you in there. That's a pretty close race. Keep it up. 76. Can we get over 80% of you? 79. 
Just about there. One more vote. Can we get one more vote from someone? All right. Three, two, one. I guess we're holding. So go ahead and close it out there. And a close race. A close, close race. There it is. So Trex, and since that's we consider just within a couple points uh, pretty good, we're not engineers here. Uh, so Fast and All and Trek both did really, really well, and we'll consider those both those companies are winners. Um, very good. Uh, let's go back and Kent. Do we have any questions from anyone? Has anyone uh, raised a hand? We have some questions. So, for with respect to Trex, uh, Janet got 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 some work here. Um, so the question from Robert is: Do we know why the Q3 sales profits and earnings dipped so much? And I think this is also the uh, same question for for Gentex. Um, so that would be the first question. And and I'll let you answer that one. Then I got another Trex question. Okay, from what I've read, uh, inventories had built up in Lowe's and Home Depot and, and the channels. And so rather than these companies buying products from Trex, they started lowering the inventory. And Trex expected that. And so from what I've read, that that's the answer to that question. Now that the um, the, the, the sales actually declined 40% on a year over year basis, but that's because those distributors weren't getting new orders. They were getting rid of their current inventories. The main reason for a reduction in demand, according to Value Line, was most likely due to the higher interest rates and increased uncertainty in the economy. And of course, Trex benefited tremendously during COVID because people stayed at home and they remodeled and repaired and that type of thing. Awesome. I hope that answers awesome. the question. Uh, let's see, Robert, I guess you let's see, could, could let us know if it answers the question or not. So, oops. All right. So Robert, if you want, you can uh, go ahead and pipe up and let us know if that answers the question. Uh, so the question that I had is the, uh, that also had that popped up here was, um, as far as Gentex goes, it looks like it also had a uh, uh, last quarter uh, substantial dip. And so um, it, any idea why that's that's happening, Cynthia? So according to us, the analysts around the dip for that the last quarter, um, it's still they're still putting it on the, the supply disruption with the chips. Again, it's a technology company. Um, that's what it was very vague, but that's where it, it lies right now. It lies with the supply chain. The chain supply is where that disruption is. Other than that, they didn't give much other. Uh, because again, they're doing a lot of their uh, acquisitions um, via all cash, so it can't be the acquisitions that's bringing it down. Okay. Um, and then back to Trex. Uh, Dean asks, is Trex primarily residential, um, and do they have any exposure to commercial construction? They did have a, a commercial segment. But they found that it was um, dragging them down, I think, and they had the opportunity to get rid of it. And, and there has been a recent press release talking about that, and I did talk about that in one of my slides, that they did sell all their commercial assets, and they're focusing just on residential now. Okay. And uh, so that, and it appears you answered Robert's question about the Q3 sales. And let's see, we also have a comment for everybody uh, from Dean, who's with the Northwest Ohio Model Club in the Buckeye chapter. He says, great presentations. It's the first time he's been here and he really likes the meeting format and how fast and informative it is. All right, any other questions? If you all raise your hand, if you've got a question, um, I will 
uh, go ahead and let you talk. Any more questions? Not people not seeing any questions. People have been gotten really quiet over the last couple months. We don't people don't want to open up their hands or something like that. Either that or our presentations have gotten Holiday so. Turkey. Well, I, I think it could be that the presentations are just such first rate that uh, you know they just answered every question that they had. So yeah. anyway, all right. That let's, uh, let's go on to our next slide, Cheryl. Oops. So if you have any other questions or stuff, here are some places where we can be reached. Uh, there's a, a contact at Gmail for digging into the BI, and then there's the, both the Maryland and DC regional contact information. And there's a picture of many of us that are a part of this uh, here that we're all down at Bink in, uh, in Dallas. So please uh, hang out with your local chapters. It seems like we do have a few chapter directors. Again, if you're not from this area, you're more than welcome to come. We'll have this up on YouTube, hopefully later on tonight depending on how well I get through everything. But uh, please uh, be part of our community, uh, even if you don't live in Maryland, D.C. or Virginia. Next slide. Uh, and then also, uh, you don't have to be in the D.C. chapter, but if you sign up for our mailing list, I see our, our uh, Interspire expert is, is on here, Carol. Uh, you don't have to be there. Just sign up. And that way, she's really good about getting out notices on this and stuff that's educational. So uh, you'll be able to share that and, uh, and be part of our community and make sure that you don't miss any of these upcoming webinars. Next slide. And Kent, why don't you tell us about volunteering and all that good all stuff? Right. Well, so as as Kevin mentioned earlier in the in the broadcast, everyone who is presenting this evening is a volunteer. And we do this volunteer work because we really are interested in making differences in other folks' lives, whether it's folks who are attending the broadcast or folks in our own individual clubs. So if you found this uh, presentation beneficial, share a link, uh, share a YouTube video with someone that you know. Uh, next slide, please. And these are some of the benefits that folks, if if you would like to volunteer, uh, be a chapter volunteer, these are some of the benefits that you can actually receive for being a volunteer. Um, one of the, the big benefits that I have enjoyed is attending the Better Investing National uh, Convention at a reduced reduced rate and also getting to uh, spend some time working with folks at the at the conference and learning a lot uh, in the process. So, so lots of benefits. There. That's it. Next slide. And let's see. So, Kevin, I think you're up here. Yeah, uh, I, I was talking without uh, unmuting myself. So, February, we're, uh, we've got the stock to study in the undervalued feature. Um, and so that's Icon and William Sonoma. Uh, Cheryl, are you typing? No. It's, uh, it sounds like someone is typing. Anyway, um, so then there's uh, then the other two stocks we're going to be looking at are going to be Clearfield and MDC Holdings. So that's going to be uh, next February, February um, 6th. But wait, let's go to our next slide. And we have something even extra special for you. Uh, we are going to have a January webinar in two weeks' time. We've been doing this now every six months or so. What we do is we look back at some of the stocks that we presented. Again, we're not managing a portfolio or doing anything like that. But we're going back and having some of the presenters review their stocks and say, oh, what, what went right, what went wrong, what needs to be adjusted? So we're just looking at the stocks from when we started this in November of 2020 all the way through December of 2021. We won't look at any of the 2022 selections, but we'll do that in July. So we'll just have a couple. We have about four or five of our presenters to sort of go over some of the ones that did well or maybe didn't do so well and what we can learn from it. So please come back for that one as well in two weeks' time. Hopefully we'll, we should be able to get a, a, a blast email out on that too. 
uh, let's go to one more slide. I think we have one more, maybe two. Um, and yes, if you want to see some of the performance metrics on things, uh, the best place to do it is up on Manifest. You don't have to be a, a, a subscriber to Manifest to get it, but I do have separate dashboards for all the selections based on whether they were in 2021 or 2022, plus the ones that were picked by you as our winning selections, we put them up as well. If we go to our next slide, I can show you how to do it. And again, you do not have to be a member of uh, Manifest to do it. These are public published dashboards. There's a hyperlink to the one for 2021. Uh, if you're a, are a subscriber, you can go to search dashboards and it'll be in, in digging into and you'll see all of them listed there. Click on that where the red circle is and you will be able to get um, uh, see all the stocks and how they have performed since we put them in there. Uh, so I think the one more slide and we should be done. So there's the dashboards. Uh, you can click on any one of those if you downloaded the handouts. Um, again, you sort of open up that control panel and you'll see handouts, make sure to get those. And finally, if we go to our final slide, we again can be found on YouTube. That hyperlink will take you to the YouTube page. Uh, it should be up maybe later on tonight if I don't get sidetracked with something else. Uh, but that is really it. Thank you all for coming. We'll see you in two weeks' time when we do our review of the stocks that we did in 2020 and 2021. And we'll see you hopefully in a month when we come up with our new stocks where we dig into the BI. So thank you all. Good night.